Thanks everyone for joining and thanks everyone online. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Diego Herrera, who's our local RI specialist in equity, diversity, and inclusion. He has a lot of experience in this space from what I've read. So 16 years, uh, he's worked at uh, several institutions, including uh, University of Ottawa. He has a PhD in intercultural communication and development from the University of Montreal, worked for UN Women, He's worked in uh, several countries as well, uh, with Indigenous, uh, with women, with uh, displaced persons. So really an honor to have you here today to speak to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. C can you hear me? Well, on you Zoom? You hear yourself in the room, it'll only hear you on Zoom. Okay, but can, can they hear me well uh, on Zoom? Okay. Perfect. Okay, so thank you everyone for being here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure sharing all this uh, knowledge, experience, and especially connecting with you. I think this is a good opportunity to think of partnership, how to work together, and also how to make the RI a better place to work and to connect better our research with the needs of people uh, in, uh, in Canada. Okay, so let's see how this works. Yeah, so this is the agenda. I think it's a little bit many things, but we could see if we can cover all that or we can cover other, other topics in a different session. So let's talk about some key concepts and current situation of equity seeking groups, um, EDI in the research team. Then we're going to have a quiz to see if we have learned something. And EDI in the research design and the conclusion and discussion. I think the main thing is, you know, when we talk about EDI, we have, like two options, EDI in the research team and in the research design, both are equally important. One is how we do research within our team and with the people we work with. And the other one is how we connect to the people we work for. So it's, we are always talking about coherence, right? A consistency in the way we do our work. So let's see if we can go in depth in this area or if we postpone that for our next session okay um so let's start with a quick uh icebreaker okay so i have like a small uh, uh survey here that susan will help us project on zoom and we have like uh, one question why to adopt edi approaches in research and uh we have five answers, because it is a trend, because it is mandated by the funding agencies, because it improves the quality of the research experience, because it improves the quality of research results, you don't know or more than an answer. And if you, ca you can answer here or live. I could see the results here on my computer. I don't think they're going to be able to respond, are they? They will be able to respond on Zoom. You can share that. I don't think so, but okay. <laughs> I see that there's one person answered. You can't disappeared. Yeah, we do. Very far. Okay, the first one. Because it is a trend, because it is mandated by the funding agencies, because it improves the quality of the research experience, because it improves the quality of research results, I don't know, or more than an answer. Hmm. Did you find it? No? Yeah, we're slow. <laughs> Very complicated. Okay. They can answer. Okay. Okay, we're getting some answers. And it is anonymous. You don't need to. Yeah, but students just 
all these guns are so fancy. <laughs> We're still catching up. <laughs> yeah, it's still catching up. Embarrassing. Can I go back to the website? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah well i don't know i don't know if i can project them yeah. oh, your okay okay it's in my laptop but i can <laughs> so was everyone able to... no i can show you the evidence <laughs> so are we done okay so we got 80% of people said more than one answer. 82% of people said more than one answer. 9% said because it improves the quality of the research experience. 9% because it improves the quality of research results. I guess. No, nobody, nobody shows because it is a trend. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody, because it is mandated by the funding agencies. Nobody. Okay, it's because you for didn't work. Okay, and nobody said I don't know. We see a lot of honesty within the chat. Yeah. So, what do you think about these results? Okay, uh, more than an answer, eighty-two percent, because it improves the quality of the research experience. 9% because it improves the quality of research results. What do you think about these results? Uh, yeah, Leila. Okay. Yeah, so we want to, to give it a good image. Okay, good, yeah. Hi. Ah, okay. Yeah. So it's more the emphasis on EDI in the research teams yeah. than in the results. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, of course, the results that's reflected in my results, but I do know that in working with other teams, there seems to be a, a lack of knowledge in terms of how to. Um, they assess all the right things, but they don't use it properly. Mm -hmm. White people, to let's look at SES and break it down. Let's not just have white and other. Let's please show what the sample is about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that kind of knowing how to use the information that's being collected, they're finally collecting it, but they don't know how to present. It. Yeah, how to present, how to adapt it to the different publics. Yeah. Okay. Great. And other thoughts. Say that there maybe one of the reasons why we have people that are anti sustainability is that, and this is not a criticism, but a lot of the time when we do a talk about EDI, the people who are more likely to come to attend the talk are people who already kind of know about it. And mm -hmm. <laughs> versus like the people that maybe to actually learn about uh -huh. their options. Uh, yeah, so we give the preach to the converted. I wish that this question was placed in a way that would allow us to see who's here because it's a trend. Who's, who's in the 80% because they selected the first two things. Because that would be more than one answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. More than an answer is more than an answer is very ambiguous and it could be because it is a trend, because it is required. Yeah. Any comments from from Zoom? No, so far? Okay. So can we go back to the presentation? Yes. Thank okay. you. Are we going back to the website at any point? No. Or... No. Uh... Yeah. So, yeah. So, 
yeah, when we talk about the, the idea today is to talk why we need to talk about EDI and research and how, okay? So let's go to the why first. Um, and let's see. This is a reflection that I want to make with you all because after working with too many researchers, I always see, you know, that the same, the same questions come back, you know, and it's, and there's no formula about EDI. It's more like how we integrate the, this into our, our reality. So the first reflection is how many squares can you find here below? Seventeen, yeah. Twenty-five. Twenty-two. Yeah. Well. On Zoom, how many how many squares can you see? Six or twenty-six or no more thirty. <laughs> yeah, I was told there were there there were there are thirty. Okay, and me I was able to see twenty-five, but you see twenty-three, twenty-six, twenty-one. Who is right in the answer? Three more, three more votes for thirty. Thirty. Okay, good. So we all have our reasons to say there is 23, there is 25, there, there are there are there are 30, right? And we have different positions, you know, to identify why we saw 23 or 30. On Zoom, they were they were quicker to see 30 than us who identified less than them. So our, their conditions were different to ours, right? We have distractions, we have different perceptions, or is the common, you know, idea of is this a six or is this or or is this a nine? You know, if you're right, it doesn't mean that you're right. It's you don't have seen life from my side, right? You don't have you haven't seen the perspectives I have. The perspectives we have here in this room are different from the ones who are in the rooms, in their sofa, with a lot of, you know, uh, uh, facilities and, you know, on the commodity of their warm homes. But now we are together, we have other pressures, other conditions, right? So all the knowledge we, we produce is conditioned. All the knowledge we produce is situated is located, right? There's no such a thing called universal knowledge. There's no such a thing called unlocated knowledge, okay? And I want to go back to very feminist theories on knowledge of Donna Haraway who says, we always have a body through which we know the world. We are not, we always, it's all, knowledge is always situated partial, locatable, critical, and can be connected with other webs of knowledge, okay? Our knowledge depends on where we are situated, on where we are not situated, okay? So our knowledge is always, is always partial. There's always partiality in the ways we see the world, okay? And very importantly, when you talk about, when we are told about these kinds of universal forms of knowledge, right? Neutral forms of knowledge, scientific forms of knowledge, these are always connected to positions of power. Why? Because they, they erase the position of the viewer, okay? They erase the position of the one who is promoting this form of knowledge, right? So they're always hiding who knows, who classifies. There's a good example of this. What is the language we use to classify the word? What is the language we use for taxonomy? Latin, right? Latin. 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 Is Latin a universal? It's Latin. Of too many languages, right? Before that, it's, it's Sanskrit and Bali. Right, right. Before that, Sanskrit. Yeah, exactly. It's part of that. But is is Latin? What 
Why Latin is called Latin? Because it comes from Latio, right? So it is a local language, okay? The thing it was connected to a universalistic, you know, process such as the Roman Empire and so on, and then to colonization to make of this a universal knowledge, but it is a form of situated knowledge. But the colonization, the empire project erased the, situa the situation of this knowledge, right? And they, they make us believe that this was universal, that this was the accurate way to know. And since this was universal, everything that was different, Pali, Sanskrit, indigenous languages and so on, could be erased, okay? So according to this, we, we created hierarchies in some knowledges and diminished other ones. And not only that, we created hierarchies for, for some knowers, and dismissed other knowers. So that's the origin of our biases. That's the origin of how we exclude many people from science. And that's where we see, we say, this is scientific. This is what we will include in our, in our project. This is what we will include in our reports. And this is part of your personal life. This is part of your claims. This is uh, less important because it's not scientific. So. EDI is about how we can go back to the reflection of situating our knowledge, okay? Of how important situating ourselves in our fields is and how important is recognizing those the situation of people who are in our, in our, in our, in our field of knowledge and how we can enrich our fields from these different experiences of these people who are situated perhaps in the margins. Yeah, yeah, it's, it comes from feminist perspectives and feminist per perspectives want, of course, to dismantle, you know, patriarchy, to dismantle inequality. So we want to shake the ways, yeah, things uh, are done. Yeah. <laughs> in my question, Dr. I'm totally unaware of the progress that has been made in other parts of the world. <laughs> like, there's been so much of scientific development in China, in India, in Persia, and the narrative has been completely wiped out. So people are not interested in knowing that narrative. Happy in their biases, yep. that nothing existed before yep. the Greco Roman civilization, which is an absolute myth, yeah. which is a lie. So, when you are so vested in understanding and appreciating the lie, you have to transcend it. You have to have the Humility to acknowledge yeah. that. How many people in this part of the world have that humility? If they did, you would not have to attend lectures. Exactly. If exactly. We need to create the, and we need. Yeah. They're not. They're not perfect. Work. Yeah. Of course. and cultures in other parts of the world, which has impacted our understanding. So the prismatic view of the world always impacts, you know, everything, the engagement, everything else. Like yeah, that, right? exactly. It's, yeah, it's like, you know, knowledge is an instrument of power, right? Lo knowledge is a way to legitimate some positions of power, right? And by validating some knowledge to the detriment of others, right? We are creating disparities that will then, you know, tr translate into social disparities, into political disparities. Who can speak? Only the ones, you know, who we acknowledge as uh, valid knowledge. Yeah, Leila. Yeah. 
the the process and all the questions we have to perform, we cannot not know anything <laughs> or not to be educated, but because they are either older or because they are uh, men or because they have uh, money in the university, that's the, the way. I don't know. What are the <laughs> freedom? They are going to control my life mm -hmm. uh, as they did. So, so it's like uh, I, I, I believe in a sense there needs to be an openness from their side, but it's also from our side sort of seeing. Yeah. Now, I'm I'm not saying we are in a, an imperfect world and everything that is not the Western culture is perfect. Okay, we're not. What we are saying is that our societies, yeah. you know. Our societies have been built yeah. on the regimes of knowledge, right? That are connected to projects of power, you know? And within these regimes of knowledge, we have validated some forms of knowledge that some of them are dominant here in the West. And there are other regimes in the non-Western countries. Now, we are in a position of privilege as researchers, as you know, people who do research, who make decisions re related to science, to publication, what is considered as knowledge. Yeah, of course. So, but we can use this position of privilege, right? Always when you have a position of privilege, you have a duty, right? A privilege comes with a responsibility, right? And we have this responsibility of how to make all of this, you know, more connected to other forms of knowledge that were dismissed historically, you know, and other forms of knowers, other forms of experience that have been uh, 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 under uh, dismissed. So this is the idea. The idea is how, you know, we enrich our teams, we enrich our research experience, you know, through the visions of other groups that have been historically marginalized, historically excluded, because they are not, they don't correspond to the no dominant visions of knowledge, because they are not uh, connected to the masculine, white, Western visions that have been traditionally dominant, right? So this is one first key message that I want to transmit today, how EDI, you know, is a way implementing equity, diversity, and inclusion in your research teams is bringing other forms of knowledge, bringing other forms of questions, other experience that may not look like scientific, but that may enrich your scientific experience, right? Think about, think about when you are trying to explain your concepts, your research to your uncle, to your cousin, to your grandma, right? Sometimes it happened to me that I tried to explain that to my father and he raised questions and it was like, why is he asking that? He's really disconnected about that. But then when I was doing my abstract and trying to sell it to other people, I said like, Oh, I'll put that in those terms because that's the way people will understand that. Yeah. Exactly, because I need to relate that to practical life, right? So these experiences enrich life, these experiences enrich uh, all the work we do. So our basic and 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 this self-reflexivity about our position so far is critical when we want to apply EDI and research, right? So we're not talking here about a section of your research project. We're not talking about a sentence, a formula. It's about how you address the very experience of research for your team and for knowledge users and for the participants in your research, okay? So what is this about? I like this image here. Because when you talk, and, and I'm, I'm going to talk about the three very notions, equity, diversity, and inclusion, right? I like this image because we all have, we may have the same goals, right? Completing the race, uh, we have equal goals. But if we give everyone the same tool, we may create deformities, right? We may create exclusions because we treat everyone in the same way, you know, the 
uh, uh, one size fits all approach. In contrast, if we adapt our tools to the conditions of these people, we will create, the, we will treat them differently. Yeah, there's there won't be equality, but there will be equity. There will be a trans a transient measure to for them to be adapted to complete the the goal and to have the same conditions to complete the goal. But very importantly, how do you know that you needed this smaller bike? How did you know that you needed this adapted tool for this person? You need to create the conditions for people to be heard. And you need to create the relationship of trust for them to express their needs. So that's an important component of an EDA approach. So how? What are the mechanisms to listen to the order? And what is the trust you create for others to use those mechanisms? And how do you build, do you build these mechanisms of trust? You, you, you build trust by using those mechanisms for something useful. So they, they need to see results. They need to see that this is useful for them. So this is a definition that I like a lot. This equity means removing barriers to the equal participation of the designated groups, which will not occur with enforceable and systemic intervention, right? The exclusions have been systemic, right? So equity, inclusion needs to be systemic too. We need to continuously listen to people. When you talk about diversity, we are talking not about diversity just for the sake of diversity. We need diversity for the sake of creating innovation, creating new solutions, bringing new questions, right? How we establish horizontal relations with groups and visions historically excluded just because they are different, right? Remember the, everything that wasn't white, that wasn't Western, that wasn't in, coded as Latin, right? It was excluded. Now, how are we going to bring all these different histories? Uh, there are many examples in the medical field, right? Women spend more time with their patients so they, pre they they're more focused on preventions they uh, their patients visit less the doctor because they need that less right because this, they create this relationship of trust so how can we enrich the field by these approaches that maybe some people see as inefficient because they spend more time as too non-scientific because they speak a lot but ultimately that creates a productive connection at the long term. Yeah, Nikki. Yeah. Is there a project team before this call? Because I'm just surprised to see when people made us realize that the is Yeah. After so what is the destination that I really saw how determined they are to level the playing field. So do you think 2020 was the point where actually the world realized that the elephant in the room is inequity. Yeah. In in our HIV space, we realize that stigma and discrimination is the bigger elephant in the room than all these tools that we have to visualize. I have that question too. Like why now? I think like why now? Why, why this has been going on for such a long yeah. time, right? Yeah. To the world, right? Yeah. yeah. No, but what do you mean? What do you mean is that? Yeah. It's the what I mean is, is that do we have new definitions according to the experience of the pandemic, for instance, the reflections that came after the pandemic? Yeah. Because most organizations have been asked by the federal government to do Yeah. This is coming from the federal government. Yeah. There is not a chance in how this would have been. Exactly. Uh, this would have played out. Let's be honest, guys. Yeah. yeah. It's not just people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I totally and agree. It's also by the politics of the place. So it's not just in North America. It's also like in Asia. The yeah. So I'm just surprised and curious to know, you know, the, the underpinnings of this. How how is it coming about? And is it is there a code before 2017? Like why are they defining it so well? Why wasn't it defined before? Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I think it was very well defined yeah. by the different social movements, you know, by the different, you know, all the definitions about intersectionality, about feminism, about the queer uh, movements and so on. However, this didn't, this had not taken the importance, it, exactly the momentum it took. Yeah, now it's being 
formalized within policies, right? Within policies, which I believe is a good opportunity, a very good opportunity to mobilize the topic with other people who are thinking at that in different ways, who could mobilize that in, in a different way, but it could be a risk as well, because, you know, all this strength of social movements could be, you know, co-opted by the politicians and policies and so on. So it could lose momentum. I was in the UK one week, uh, one month ago, and I was very surprised in the ways there. And, you know, we always think about the UK as a very conservative country, right? But I was very surprised by the ways they bring always the the discourse of, of social movements, the discourse of the labor movement, the discourse of class, right? Here in Canada, when we talk about the EDI, we're not, we don't talk a lot about poverty. They did. They mobilized the topic about poverty. What do we have to learn from trans people? So that's, that, that's interesting, you know, how we, we use the policies, but we do not lose the connection with the the, the the grassroots that created all these reflections because these reflections only came from the margins, right? Yeah, uh, Heidi. What a wonderful question that you have. Um, and I, my sense is EDI is a bright, polite way to have conversations that are coming more and more out of people who do critical theory, race theory. Yeah. Um, because yeah. we're going to be talking about dismantling whiteness like supremacy. So I think EDI seems to be a little bit more easily digestible. Yeah. And critical race theory is coming off of black thought, right? So if you look at the history of black thought, if you just go to James Baldwin, the fire. Yeah, right. So he's going to be saying all of these things, but because he's a black man, mm -hmm. he's in the yeah, and he's also, you know, building off of already a very well placed, articulate thought process. Um, you're going to read his book. You're going to see everything that's 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 being said here. So I think it's that this may be actually more digestible for people who, I mean, I'm not saying this about people in the room right now, but I think overall, EDI seems to be more digestible for people who don't want to say. White supremacy. Yeah. White supremacy. Mm. Really charged charge to yeah. yeah. And so people are just thinking, no. Yeah. Like, we, we, you know. But I could talk about, you know, equity and genetic maybe foods. Yeah. And not be forceful. Right. So it, it also kind of distracts us from really looking at what it would be able to say. What are the ways that policies impact our lives? So the fact that voting becomes legal for different parts of the population in North America, so if you look at Canada, when did indigenous people vote compared to when did the white male property owner get yeah. The white male property owner has a lot more experience than the indigenous voter by the time that they're both doing it. So if we don't have this kind of historical understanding about why we are here today, it's harder to dismantle things. So thank you. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Yeah, because we could call this as well like anti discrimination policies, exactly. right? This, as a psychologist, that's what I definitely meant. We could call that like that way, maybe yeah. as Heidi is saying, but we're trying to exactly we are trying to create concepts that are more socially acceptable but ultimately what we are looking for is social justice, exactly. right? Within the, the work, yeah. within the work we do and let's go for it let's let's put it in a more digestible way to see if we can go further right yeah. okay uh go ahead <laughs> oh, okay i'm happy that you're <laughs> sorry okay okay I'm, I'm happy that you're enjoying that i i am Okay, um, so why diversity again? It brings more innovation. You know, you bring more questions from different people and you anticipate risks. This is very important. Imagine if you don't do this work, you're going to have many people who are silented, many people who are harassed, many people who are not listened, many people who, who will experience the feeling of exclusion and exclusion leads to conflict. So it's a way to be a better place. You know, it's a, be it's a way to conduct research in a better way. It's a, it's a, it's a way to coexist better where we are, okay? 
And I love this quote, and I, I really suggest you to watch this movie, the, the this documentary, Picture Scientist. It is on Netflix and us at the RI. We are the owners of the license. So if you want to watch it, I can share with you the quote. And one researcher said, she's a racialized woman in the US, in the US, and she says, who asks the question and how defines the field of knowledge, right? So according to where you are situated, you are going to raise questions. You are going to bring new problems. You are going to bring new solutions, right? So what we want is to enrich our field with these questions. Imagine this machine, right? Who pushes the button? It's human people from their experiences, their background. So all this influences uh, the, the science we're producing. But we've been taught that this, this needed to be erased, this human situation needed to be erased. When we talk about EDI, we're talking about bringing all this humanity, acknowledging this humanity, and acknowledging the richness that it, it gives to the science we do. What is the purpose of this? Is creating a feeling of inclusion, ensuring that everyone is valued, creating collective empowerment, right? Feeling that you are influential, feeling that, creating the feeling that you are hurt, strength and confidence, and mainly create the feeling of belonging, okay? That's what we want, to people to feel they belong to that, that place, that they are engaged, that they can innovate, that their beliefs, their beliefs and values are important. And that's why, we need to get rid from this vision, this binary vision between science and private life, work and 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 in private life. This, you know, our emotions, our beliefs, our background, it's part of the science we do. It's part of the concept. <laughs> yeah. And and I can share that those. Faculty Canada and Institute of the other side. Like a lot of the data go around challenges Canada. But the funny thing is that they, they brought on these conversations to highlight the inequities in another part of the world. Yeah, yeah because they were getting money to do the to solve the problems in another part of the world, predominantly fueled by the Gates Foundation and the US. Yeah. But now these conversations have also been used to improve the lives of the people in Canada itself, especially after those, you know, those graves were yeah. discovered. Yeah. All of that happened. The, the 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 whole table is still like you know use those innovations that are more process. So I think that this the, the short term solution is to disruption is innovation. Yeah. Yeah. And right. Ad nauseum about the problems yeah. and the the elephant in the room is always going to be inequity given you know the yeah. the health outcomes. It's the same story in communicable diseases, whether it's respiratory, whether it's cardiovascular, whether it's psychology, whether it's COVID, whether it's HIV, whether it's STI. It's the same story again. Yeah. The thing to do is to really think of innovations to kind of level the playing field and to bring about equitable access. And there's enough and more data that they, that that works. The only thing is you need political will and integration. Yeah. So that's that's the sh short term disruption, but the long term disruption is of course to document it so that we can do it better. So when you think bring AI. No, not AI. Not, 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 not exactly AI. Institutions could be anything. Conditional yeah. cash transfer. There's so many yeah. different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. New solutions. In terms of health outcomes, that's it's been happening. There is enough and more data. Yeah. I would feel that as somebody who's very impatient about changing human condition, I feel I get tired of writing the same story, whether it's HIV, whether it's the US, it's the same story. In fact, today I've written a column in, in the Lancet about this whole thing, and it it's the same story and it's yeah. tiring. And I'm tired of getting tenured with the publications on this topic saying the same thing again and again and again. Yeah. And keep arguing with my husband that 10 years from now it's going to be the same story because I have the same story. It's not going to be. We should stop. It's not going to be. Oh, we should stop being. We should stop being medical journalists. We should actually, all of us, should be innovating and disrupting yeah. the system because it's extremely easy to yeah. to make things equitable. People just want their health care. Yeah. People want their pain to be alleviated. You know, alleviated. They want to stop being depressed. They the stop time being of... depressed. And it's very easy. It's very simple. You just give them the solutions they want. You can level the playing field, at least for health outcomes. I'm yeah. not saying you can improve their entire life. Exactly. Yeah. And 
No. We are doing that in so many spaces. There are so many examples. It's the government that has to adopt these innovations and for their yeah. in terms of mental health. So we can't get a psychologist now privately. It, it's eight months to see a psychologist. We have digital solutions. As part of that care, I've developed them. Yeah. I've knocked on doors. Nobody is using them. As part of step care, I have strategies in the digital intervention to help with depression, to help with anxiety, to get you exercise, and to get you good sleep. So we actually can improve access. Yeah. But so with not the access, access, you want to improve the community. Yeah. Yeah. Begin with access. access. What I'm saying is begin with access with clothing similarities. So many of us in the digital health space, including Abhinav, Debbie, myself, Stephen. We have like so many solutions, but there's a value of death for me innovation. So don't get away. Yeah. And most of them can improve access to linkage, linkage to retention, and retention in care. Most of them can. But that's just one part of the problem. There are other solutions also that are non digital. We have cash transfers, for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. Cash transfers mm -hmm. that have proven efficacy in Brazil. Yeah. In many, in the disaster, the context of many disasters. Mm -hmm. You don't need to send like those fancy. You know, helicopters to yeah. them up. You can figure out smarter ways to do it, and the populations are the best place to tell you what's going on. Exactly. Prescribing to them, they should be prescribing to us. Create the conditions to hear them and to innovate from what they say, it's because. Structures in the university and hospital are not set up. Yes. None, yes. none of this matters. That is so, 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 so one, one small example. You, there's a huge push to make sure we get minorities, to get immigrants, yeah. whatever, you know, to, to get more diverse population so that we can maybe make uh, access to clinical trials more equitable. For example, yeah. all of our evidence, the therapies, drugs are on clinical trials, they're not represented. We are not allowed by research ethics or Unless it's in French and English, we are not allowed to consent these participants to take clinical trials. Even if they have family members sitting with them to explain everything, unless they can find a consent form in French, unless they can do it in English, they are not allowed to participate. We have to make every form, let's say if you have a Punjabi speaker, every form has to be in Punjabi. There has to be a Punjabi speaker at every visit that they show up to, even if they have family members that are willing to support them. The research ethics board will not allow that to pass. Mm -hmm. okay, how do you get any study done? That tries to enroll patients of minority groups of immigrant groups. You you are not allowed to by the institution. And that mandate is set by an which was informed by policy. You know, for example, but you can bring those cases, it, it, it oh, you know, into nausea. light. So this is a discussed ad nausea, right? Mm -hmm. we, yeah. we are not allowed, for example, you know, the zoo, like the use or, or DocuSign, that's actually not CFR 21 compliant. If you use DocuSign so that it makes it easier for that single mother in the community to sign up for your mm -hmm, trial, mm -hmm. you are not allowed to do that. It has to be wedding. You know, I thought that actually it was compliant, but I've been recently been told that DocuSign is actually not CFR 21 compliant. You cannot use it in a clinical trial. But red cap you can use. Red cap is one small example. Yeah, and you, you, need, you need that specific module okay. to allow that to happen. So I, I, it's, I'm just yeah. spending my frustration here, but, like, but, but these, these are systemic, we, we've had yeah. many minority patients that want to participate, yeah. but are just not allowed to. So when, when we talk about making it equitable, it's great, but we're literally handcuffed because we just cannot include and, and make our population more diverse. Yeah, right. no, and it's, I believe we, we have a lot of advocacy work to do. We have a lot of political work to do in different fronts, right? In too many different fronts, because it's that just as our populations are diverse, the exclusions are also very, very, very diverse, very different. And we, the most important thing, we need to be convinced that this is important because what you, what you said is critical. This Punjabi patient needs to be heard, but how, what are the conditions that I'm creating for them to, to be heard? This yeah. could be used as a case example. Now, Success in EDI. Mm -hmm. They get up enough problem solved. We would believe that our RIMUHC is really committed to EDI and making it happen. No, seriously. Yeah, yeah, we totally. Small baby steps to actually translating that rhetoric into action. Yeah, exactly. And for instance, we are we are having trouble uh, to integrate uh, research participants in our EDI action plan that I may explain to you later on. But 
you know, this could be a way to involve this patient, you know, these research participants there and to see where we could penetrate the system. Yeah, Layla. I'm not sure even as EBI or as educators or anything that stands as well. Yeah. Sometimes they all they have their uh, like signed the document. I have to sign our French. They don't have any English documents. And well, I end up signing them uh, because I read a little bit here and there, but I don't understand everything because. I don't speak French, and because I don't speak French, my accessibility to jobs also is very limited, mm -hmm. even though I'm very highly educated, I'm already bilingual, actually maybe more than bilingual. Uh -huh. and so it's like, and like wherever you go, it, it's the, the same issue, and it's increasingly becoming an issue. Uh -huh. With the like they are allowed now as a police to get into your home or to the companies and check their computers uh, to, to see if they are actually writing in, in, in French or English. Yeah, so with the law, yeah, the 96 law, yeah. Yeah, it's true, and it's an issue that emerged in the EDI assessment that we conducted last year, you know, the differences between the Francophone and the Anglophone community within the Institute and how especially French is perceived, you know, French speakers perceive a lot of obstacles to move, to evolve within the uh, structure of the RI, how also French is not perceived as a uh, scientific language, you know, and how we can try to give more more status to French as a language in which we communicate science, because it's true. It's not because you speak English that your ideas are better than in French, right? And also we have at least 32% of people who are not, who are, who are, whose, whose mother tongue is not French, neither uh, English. So we need to work with those people as well, because not because they don't speak English, it doesn't mean they don't have interesting language, right? It's interesting ideas. They have many things to say, but what is their contribution? And as you said, people come here and they speak already four, three languages, but maybe English is their fourth or five, fifth language. Doesn't it have a value? Yes, it has a value. There are many ideas, many experiences. Okay, I will try to complete with the time we have left, but I think it's, it's a great discussion. It's a great discussion. So what we where we want to be is, you know, this I like this um uh scheme about cognitive diversity and psychological safety. Okay. And I can share the sources with you. What we want is not diversity just for the sake of diversity. We want diversity for the sake of ideas, solutions, questions destabilizing question, destabilizing ideas that help us produce new knowledge. And for having this diversity, we need to create psychological safety, right? That's we need, huge. yeah, it's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge, but that's where we want to be because otherwise we'll stay here in a resistant, hierarchical, directive institution? Do we want instead to be experimental, inquiring, nurturing, curious? So that's our goal, right? And we need to create the conditions. And, and it's I like the matrix, right? I like the, the matrix. The more you have cognitive diversity, the more you have psycho, the more you need psychological safety, right? And you need to create the conditions for people to, to feel psychologically safe. Yeah, and the goal is, the goal is to promote cognitive diversity. That's what ultimately matters to us. It's not the, the, the skin color of the people. It's not the disability. It's the ideas that they will bring, the experiences they will bring. People who have different styles of problem solving can offer unique perspectives because just because they think differently, unlike the, the uh, demographic diversity. And also, uh, if you have one person who is high performing in a team, adding another high performing individual who thinks the same way improves the solution very little. 
beyond what Tim already has. An individual with lower accuracy, but with a different approach, brings more discussion that can be optimized for better accuracy, right? So it's, again, you know, our classification of knowledge, which has been very hierarchically, hierarchy, hierarchically, has prevented us from connecting with other visions that may enrich our, our process. Okay, so what EDI is not? This is important too, okay? Because there are too many misconceptions. It is not an empty and general statement about good intentions, okay? To include in the underrepresented groups. You need to act. You need actions on that. A way to welcome unqualified people into science just because they come from equity deserving groups. I've been told this in some committees, right? Ah, oh, what we need here is PhDs. What we need here is excellence. What we need here is... Am I saying the contrary? I'm just saying that these people come from different backgrounds, from the ones you normally know, that, that you've normally worked with. But we are putting, you know, the the background, the experiences that may they may transfer from other domains into science, right? But these people are highly qualified, but they have different qualifications from the ones that you're used to. Okay. So we want to have a wider understand wider understanding of research excellence that go beyond numbers, beyond um just you know the simplistic logics, logic of publish and perish, right? What about the community engagement of students or community engagement of researchers? What about the influence they've had in policies? What about the patents, the creation, the arts they've done? All this has a richness. All this has uh, the, the, the involvement in committees. All this enriches the 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 experience of being a researcher. Why don't we value all this and we see how this can enrich our uh, idea of 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 the science we do? A section of your research projects project or work plan to comply with a requirement without showing actual commitment to action. This is not EDI. This is exactly the opposite of what we want to do. And I'm still receiving requests from researchers saying. We can talk to the eye all we want, but if the researchers are not doing it correctly, mm -hmm. this is what we got. Yeah, and if they believe this is a sentence, right? If they believe this is a section in their, it is not a section. To X. I can tell. Is this really easy on, or is this something that's in the flesh that they know they want to do? I can tell. And that one is not going to Exactly. And, you know, I revised a lot of research proposals. You know, I was just uh, in the process of supporting the Read Ready Award competition. The Ready is the competition for racialized and Black persons uh, from CIHR. And I read the entire proposition, many things that I didn't understand at all, you know? It's like, okay, this molecule here and there. And I was like, okay, good. <laughs> But I need to read that. Yeah. Why? Because EDI is an approach. Because EDI is a way to do research. So it needs to transpire, you know, it needs to be, you have to feel it since the very way you present yourself, you know, there were very good candidates saying, I was a person uh, who was an immigrant uh, in the past and I have uh, um, I was able to adapt into Canada. Yeah, what else can you tell us about being exactly about being an immigrant? How has this informed your teaching philosophy? How has this informed your pedagogy? How immigrant status is not even in the questionnaires. Sometimes they don't even ask where you're born in Canada. Like I, I, I just don't. Yeah. But some, but but you need to find ways to mobilize this, right? Sometimes we are very good at saying I belong to this network and so on. Yeah, but what did you learn about dealing with differences, negotiating with different visions, and creating new knowledge from that? Okay, so it's an approach transversal conception. It's it's transversal to teams conception, data collection, analysis, dissemination of knowledge. Very important. 
you can also decide to emphasize on one part, one component of your research project, right? Let's say you're working with, uh, I had a researcher who was work, working with zebra fish, right? How can we integrate intersectionality in an analysis of zebra fish and, and te doing tests on zebra fish for the treatment of Alzheimer, okay? I was like, okay, this is really a challenge. I didn't know what, well, just try to see sex differences, okay? But then the, 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 the researcher, I said, okay, maybe we could think about the dissemination phase. Are there other differences, okay? Just to get the done. Are we really going to use that zebra fish? She's got she's she's using the she's using that for, to create a model to treat Alzheimer. Alzheimer. No, it's true. But it was very interesting because she said, I, I asked, okay, are there some people excluded in this process? Are there some people, some visions that we haven't taken into account? And she said, caregivers. No one has spoken about caregivers. No, ha no one has met, has conducted analysis of, you know, gender, age of caregivers, and how they could influence the adherence to treatment. To treatment, and he said, like, oh, this is great. Put that into your proposal, please. So, EDI helps us innovate because we can see this population that have been marginalized, that have been excluded, that have been hurt, and now your research is an opportunity to hear them. Yeah, right? May I make a may I make a comment or ask a question? Yeah. This is Justin Sanders, um, and I really appreciate this discussion. I think what, there's a tension inherent to what you're saying here, you know, there with the idea, so if, if, if EDI provides an approach to research, then, um, then it suggests that there are other approaches in which that we don't that we that we're making a choice about the inclusion of principles of edu of um, diversity equity and inclusion in our research and i think there's a there's a a movement to suggest that edi is not necessarily a pro an approach but something that needs to be infused in all of our research in various ways and so i think there's a there just seems to me to be a tension there between saying that this is a choice that we make um, about how to make our work better rather than saying the entire research enterprise needs to understand the fact that um, incorporating principles of edu of diversity, equity, and inclusion really makes our research quality better and that there are ways of doing so at various stages in our uh, in the pipeline of our research from the way in which we form research teams to the degree that we describe or participate in exercises of reflexivity and um, awareness of our social positions, to how we collect data, to how we report data, and um, and for whom we, you know, participate in knowledge translation activities. So I'm just curious how you think about that tension between sort of uh, between those sort of two positions on this. Yeah, but if I understand correctly, it's like there's a tension between. Um, making choices about how to implement EDI and how to, and, and 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 focusing on some on some stages of the research project right no i'm saying that there's a tension between saying that EDI is a choice we make um that might make our that that you know that we can make a case that it strengthens the quality of our research and the experience of our research but um there's another position which says this is not optional uh, and I think that, and I think that that's the tension is like saying, oh, these are some tools that we can use and we can approach, you know, we can, and some philosophies and practices that we can incorporate. And then other people are saying, no, this is actually essential and not a choice, but, but really not a matter of uh, whether, but a matter of how. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I, I believe I believe, um, yeah, it, it it depends on your position as a researcher, right? It's more and more a requirement from the funding agencies. But just as Debbie was saying, it's it shows when you do this just to comply with with a requirement, For right? Sure. It's, it's like, how are you convinced about this, and how do you feel this will enrich? your project, 
right? Yeah. So it's like, uh, and I think self-reflexivity is an ability that everyone can develop, that everyone should develop, even if you are, you know, you, you don't belong to a marginalized group, if you've been in a privileged role, you know, yeah, because if you've been uh, in a privileged position, self-reflexivity will help you use your privileges to create better conditions for other people, you know, for other research and for other uh, use, knowledge users. So it's how we, I, I, would, I could say, and what I really like about EDI and research is how we connect research to the needs of population, right? How we make this useful for something. I, my, when I was doing my PhD, I drew a lot on decolonizing research, right? And in the colonization of research, we always raise the question, who is this research for? Is this for the researcher or is this for the population you're working with? And who's, who's the owner of this research? Is the, 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 um, journals where you're going to publish or is the people who will benefit from this knowledge so i think my trend is going more for the people more for the for the users so that's where i believe as researchers we have the possibility of developing our self-reflexivity to be able to say okay what is going to be my position and how will i try to connect my project more my results more to the needs of people i think i think my i mean i appreciate all of that i think my my point is is that um if we frame it as a choice then there are going to be a bunch of people who choose not to do that and they're going to and they're going to choose the they're going to choose the regulatory um uh approaches that are more they're going to approach the regulatory aspects of research as more of a tick box exercise and I think it's kind of about how we build, you know, if we're going to build a culture in which these are infused in every research project, because there is the possibility for that to be true, then we, then I think we, we maybe need to not think about it as a choice, but as a, but continue to make the case that this, this makes all research better. Yeah, I think we shouldn't, uh, I think it would, it would be a mistake to make EDI like a mandatory thing, right? I think it would be better just to show how it is beneficial, how it enriches research and how each one, each you know, research group, institution positions itself regarding you know, taking an EDI approach. But because otherwise it can be very easily instrumentalized, right? You can be very good at you know, complying with what CIHR says, but at the end your research team climate you know is toxic and you know you're very good externally but not internally so it's more a reflexive uh, uh um, approach a reflexive ability that you try to develop within your team and and i think each one decides it's his or her own way to implement this within their team or project that's Right. So I hear you saying how is how is better than whether. Um, but I yeah, I think this is exactly the tension I'm talking yeah. about. And so it's I mean, yeah, it, you know, yeah, and maybe and that, and that I, I agree, I agree hundred percent. We need to show cases that have worked. We need to show experiences that have worked and that could inspire people to do that. Yeah. 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 What are they trying to achieve with this EDI regulation? Uh, at the RI? Yeah. yeah. Well, we have an EDI action plan. We have like two goals. The first goal is that all our research projects are responsive and connected to the, the diversity of Canadian population. So to strengthen the excellence of research by connecting it to, to being representative, being uh, able to respond to the, this diversity of population. And the second one is that our institution inside is free from harassment, free from discrimination, and creates the condition for, for everyone to bring innovation and to, to thrive in their capacities regardless of their origin and background. So that's like, you know, 
our, our goal, okay? Okay, I will wrap up with this. What is not, not it's not revealing confidential data without our authorization. So this is very common in, in many, in many uh, uh, proposals. People say we are very good because we are half women and 30% immigrants and so on. But this only shows that, that you are complying with the status quo, that you're not looking for more diversity. You are not respecting confidential protocols. And you are assuming many things, you know, because you don't know exactly if this person self identify these people self identify according to these uh, conditions. So it's uh, EDI is very connected to ethics. You know, it's a, an ethical way to conduct research to produce innovation. It's not just a set of principles. It's principles, but connected. To, connected to practices. Okay, how we put this into practice, how we connect this into action, and we tend, especially when we are in public health, you know, social sciences, uh, we tend to ver be very inclusive with research participants, but not with our research teams, okay? What are the opportunities you are creating for your groups? What are the opportunities of leadership, of hearing people within your team? What are the opportunities of connection with other researchers within your network and your field? So. It is an integral approach that comes from inside to outside, okay? So it's like we need to be consistent and coherent internally and externally, right? So I think I will leave it there because it's more than 5 p.m. Uh, any take... Any takeaways from today? Yeah. 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 Well, there are two things. This, uh, the Fiera Award, the Fiera Award Prize for Racialized and Indigenous Students. It's interesting because, yeah, they had to put extra effort, but they also got extra money, right? So it is, it is interesting, and it doesn't, it wasn't conditioned, it wasn't a stipend that came from their um, supervisor, but it was a prize that was completely given to them, you know, uh, in one shot. So it was a way to stimulate those people who were self-reflective about their realities, about how they wanted to impact other, other people and how they connected they were to other uh, people from their own community. So yeah, there was extra work on that, but there was also extra compensation, yeah. However, what I get from your question, which is great, is that EDI work should be recognized as work, right? So we have an EDI advisory committee, Haiti is part of that, and we are struggling for that to be, you know, recognized within the work hours of our colleagues because they're working to for better research. They're working for better uh, climate of, of work at the RI. They're working for better conditions. So this shouldn't be voluntary work. This should be part of their work hours, and this should be part part of their performance objectives, you know, evaluation, you know, and our plan is to integrate EDI throughout the different um, uh, divisions and centers as part of the performance evaluation, okay? So that's the strategy that we want to implement within the, the EDI action plan, okay? Yeah. 
yeah so we're gonna wrap up like uh, any come anything that you're gonna take away from this conversation today Diego, I really want to thank you for a, a fantastic presentation. It was stimulating. You made us self-reflect. And one of the things I'd like to point out is I'd like more people at board to watch this video because they really need to watch this video. And at some point, I'd like you to come back with some examples of success. Yeah. Okay, perfect. We can do that in the second part. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that and hope to see you next time. Thank you so much.